Hey everyone, today I wanted to talk about base timers. Now, why are base timers important? They aren't glamorous, they're not sexy, but they are a very important part of the game. They are one of those invisibles that you won't easily notice its value, but understanding it can be absolutely game changing. So I'm going to talk about base timers in laning phase, and then base timers in the mid to late game, and then show a bunch of in-game examples. Let's get into it. Now for base timers for the laning phase, I'm going to break this up into two parts, when we are ahead and when we are behind. So starting when we are ahead, our base timer is ideally after crashing a wave into the enemy tower and preferably a stacked wave. Now the reason that we would rather crash a stacked wave is so that it's harder pre to prevent that crash from the enemy side. A single wave, if we try and crash that, that could be held outside the enemy tower comfortably sometimes. It's going to depend on the enemy's tempo, on your shove speed, but it's a good rule of thumb to have to try and crash stacked waves instead of single waves. We also want to be careful not just trading bases. So if we're ahead, we don't want to just shove a wave and then go home and then they shove a wave and then they go home and then we're kind of playing ping pong and we're never really accelerating our lead. So we either want the enemy to die or the enemy to miss an entire wave to snowball appropriately. Now, one of the most common mistakes I see, especially in lower elos, is basing on freezes. We very rarely want to resort to this option, only when absolutely necessary. And when it would be necessary is when we just don't have the freedom to crash the wave into the enemy tower. So why should we not typically look to base after freezing the wave on our side of the lane? We're going to have less gold to spend because there are all of those minions in front of us that we're not getting to execute and shove. We're going to have less XP as well, naturally, uh, on our roam timer. We are also very unlikely to be able to maintain that freeze, right? So you're holding that freeze, you base, and then the enemy team is going to come back to lane and then they're going to have that giant wave and they're just going to be able to crash it into your tower quite easily. Sure, some minions will get denied in the meanwhile, but when the enemy team comes back to lane, then they are going to have pressure in the lane. Your roam timer is also going to be affected. You're not going to have that much time to roam around because you need to try and deal with that giant wave in your lane. Now, the reason that we don't want to base when their wave is on the enemy side of the lane, hopefully this is a little bit more self-evident, but we will lose minions and we would have no time to roam. We would have to go straight back to that lane to break that freeze so that we stop bleeding minions for our ADC. Now there's going to be a little mini game that plays out quite often around trying to escort the wave into the tower and if you can or not. So let's just say we kill the enemy ADC and we want to crash the wave into tower and base, but the enemy support is trying to hold that freeze. Sometimes we have the freedom to push them off and crash the wave, sometimes we don't. Maybe we don't have the tempo or the health or the mana or the resources to be able to do so. Sometimes we would need the help of our jungler or even the mid laner on their gank to help shove that wave under the tower or sometimes we're just going to have to embrace reality and let the enemy support freeze and not waste our time but it is important to understand firstly that we really want that wave crash into their tower and secondly to make a precise and accurate assessment in the moment of if we can do so or not and sometimes when the game is getting later and later especially post eight minutes when herald is on the map if the enemy support invests in trying to freeze that lane, it's not as valuable anyway because that means that they are staying in lane without any prio and you can look to roam around and facilitate Herald. So don't worry about this point too much, we're going to go over a bunch of examples in the example section later on. Now what if you're behind in the laning phase, when should we look to base then? We want to look for a window to base and come back with full health, full mana to be able to pressure again. We just don't want to be stuck in the lane, slowly bleeding and watching yourself lose. And so this is something that you can develop an allergic reaction to, as I like to call it. If you ever catch yourself sitting under tower, watching yourself bleed, then try to kick into gear and find a window to base. Now, the best time for that is when you assess that your ADC won't get dove on a wave under our tower. So as long as your ADC is safe in collecting minions under the tower, then you are good to base and then come back and start pressuring again. The only thing that we would achieve if we're hanging around in lane watching us slowly lose, is maybe we would slightly slow down plates falling and, you know, just soak up a little bit of XP, but that's practically no point in doing so. And so this is a skill that you can optimize, right? Like how quickly can you assess if your ADC can get dove or not? Look at the enemy's body language. Does it look like they're posturing to dive? Look at the wave. Is the wave big enough to dive? Think about the enemy's threat. How much threat do they have versus your ADC? Does your ADC have their sums and do they have some self-peel? Things like that. We're going to need to take everything into account here. We also want to make sure that we're communicating that we want our ADC to base after catching a wave. Because if we're both chunked, then we don't want to be stuck in lane forever, right? Your ADC also needs to find a window to base. Communication is a very important part 
of playing League. So after they farm a wave under tower, then we can ping them to back off. What we can also do if we're behind is we can wait until our jungler is on our side of the map. And so when our jungler is on our side of the map, we want to make sure that he leaves our side of the map and especially he leaves our lane with our wave shoved into the enemy tower. Because the last thing we want is for our jungle to just do a, a half-assed gank and then the wave is still frozen on our side and we're low and now our jungle is going to clear away from us, right? And then we're going to be stranded in a losing position with no real hope. So on that note, try to avoid an autopilot low percentage gank. Just because your jungler is moving towards your lane doesn't mean you have to try and kill the enemy, right? You can lose entire games with a decision like that. You can just ping to shove the wave, shove it out, get that base off, and then you have been bought some time. So if we're behind, but we're not chunked, and the enemy bot lane ends up basing, we need to decide in the moment between basing and crashing and then basing. So ideally, we would crash the wave into the enemy tower and then base. But again, it's going to depend on how much tempo we have. You know, how long ago did the enemy bot lane base? How much shove do we have? How fast can we get this under the tower? And then we're going to make a decision in the moment. Moving on to base timers in the mid to late game. So we want to base to synchronize the time that we are on the map and off the map with our team. We want to be on the map at the same time and we want to be off the map at the same time. Now, when I talk about being on the map, that means you're actively pressuring the map, right? You're looking to do something. Your teammates are looking to do something, not just passively farming or they're not just coming out of base. And the best point of reference for this is your jungler. When your jungler is actively pressuring the map, you want to be there with him. And when he is passive and farming and basing, then we can match that tempo. This is the biggest common mistake that I see in the mid to late game in terms of basing. I see a lot of supports get very tunneled on basing so that they can replenish their wards or basing so that they can heal up or spend a little bit of gold. Meanwhile, their teammates are actively pressuring or even fighting on the map. First of all, there's no point in you healing up and getting items, then coming back out onto the map and not being able to do anything because your teammates are all dead. And second of all, our job is to be able to facilitate fights, be there for our team. We're not the carry. Our gold and our experience does not matter. It will not be the win condition. And so you really want to just embrace this. And we'll see a bunch of examples for this as well. But if your team is off the map, if we're not missing any opportunities, then of course, those are going to be our base windows to heal up or spend our gold or get our wards back. Solo queue is very fast paced though. So be prepared for these situations to be few and far between and for you to just have to be a psycho and stay on the map and provide to these skirmishes. Another time that we can consider basing in the mid to late game is right after Baron. Now, why would we want to base immediately right after getting Baron? It's so that we have a faster recall so we can use that to go back to base and spend the gold that we just got from either killing the enemy team or even just getting Baron itself. We also get to assign to different lanes, right? So if we're all around Baron, then we can't move top and mid and bot, but from base we can assign quite easily and you want to have a bunch of different lanes with the Baron buff active to get the most value out of the buff. And you can also heal from potentially taking the Baron or fighting, etc. The last base timer in the mid slate that I'm going to talk about, it's not very common, I don't want to emphasize it too much, but we can base in time to set up for neutral objectives. There's no point in basing as Dragon is spawning. We need to be there in advance to set up vision, to catch the enemy as they move in to contest, or to be able to shove midway first, force them to react to that midwave and then move to Dragon. But honestly, these situations are quite few and far between when you have the time and the freedom to just pick and choose your base timer. If you do find yourself in that situation and the pace of your game feels quite slow, then you want to give yourself at least 45 seconds, I would say, to come out of the base to contest the neutral objective. So base around a minute beforehand. We're going to have a look at some early game examples now, and we will notice that our base timer decisions are going to pretty much revolve around wave states for the early game. And so in this first example, what's going to happen is we're going to find a fight. I'll just play this out a little bit. We get a couple kills. And now I want to find a window to base, right? Israel wants to base. He just has a lot of gold to spend. I want to base. I'm going to have some gold to spend as well. We're both a little bit chunked. And so what we are going to try and do is shove this wave as fast as possible to try and get it under the tower so that it pushes back to us. Now, unfortunately, the enemy wave is really nearby. And so we can't shove this in time to get it all the way under the tower. And even if we could, because the enemy team just died, their bot lane just died, we have plenty of time to be able to shove another wave into tower and then head on back home so that we can have more gold and more experience to work with. And so that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to shove as fast as possible. You can see that I'm autoing. I'm even using my spells. I don't care if I tank a tower shot. We're shoving this wave as fast as we can 
and then we are going to base. And the result of this is that we have a really good roam timer from base. This wave is going to push into us and I have a lot of freedom to do whatever I want. Okay, next example and same game, we are Solar Rakan here. There is going to be a bit of a fight. We get some kills. We get roamed on by the Ari. And then once the dust settles, the fight is done right now. And we want to think about the wave state. If we want to base or if we want to try and shove in base, my body language, my pings, is going into leaving this wave alone. You can see that I'm pinging back on the wave. I don't want my jungler to touch this wave because the wave crashed, right? And it's pushing into us. And we wouldn't want to just deny an entire cannon wave from our ADC for no reason. But once I see my jungler commit with his body language and with his abilities, then of course I'm going to embrace reality. I'm not going to be stubborn and just ignore what's happening. So I'm gonna come over here. I'm gonna help him out begrudgingly. And then we get to escort this wave into the tower and then we can go on and base if we want. Now, if I didn't react to what my jungler was doing, maybe he would take too long to shove this wave in, especially because it's a cannon wave, and then maybe the enemy jungler would have enough time to hold the freeze, or the enemy bot lane would come back, maybe the support come back and hold the freeze, and then it would be really awkward. So we want to ensure that that wave crashes so we have the freedom to back off. Okay, next game, and in this game, we are the Rel. And so what's going to happen is there is going to be a fight. I jump on them. We end up killing the enemy ADC. And of course, I'm already thinking about what's next. If we can kill the Rakan, if we can look to crash wave and then head on home. So I really want to be able to crash in base. But in this situation, you know, they have a lot of minions here. My ADC is very low and their sup in the jungle are here pretty much full health. So this is going to be really tricky to be able to crash into the tower. But I still want to try. I want to see if it is possible. I understand how important it is. And so I'm going to look to shove. You can see my pings and my body language. Like, can we shove? Can we shove? I embrace reality. There's no way we're going to crash in base. And so now I'm going to pivot my plan to the next best option, which is probably going to be just basing under tower once the wave eventually crashes under our tower. Make sure that my ADC can collect that wave and then head on home. And so we'll just play this out a little bit. I'm moving under my tower, ready to concede. Passively catching this wave, and then we're going to look to head home. And then my jungler gets jumped on and dies. And so we're going to try and back off, but we need to remember this is in Challenger and the enemy team understands what we want to do as well. And so they're going to try and prevent us from basing here. And then it just goes from bad to worse. The base gets cancelled. We do end up getting the kill over here. And now our plan has to pivot once again, right? Since our base got cancelled on that window, we don't want to base right now because we're going to miss an entire wave under tower. So again, we're going to adapt and we're going to look to catch this wave under tower and then base. Try and catch this wave under tower. I'm trying to buy space for my ADC to collect as many minions as possible. Okay, that's as good as we're gonna get. And now my ADC can go home, and so will I. And the faster that you base after catching a wave under tower, the more likely it is that you will be able to base and come back out of base and catch the following wave. So it's not always gonna be perfect. You're not always gonna get that crash into base, but really think about the next best option. Now, just a little bit later on in this game, there's going to be another fight. I flash forwards, kill the Rakan, fight's going to play out a little bit, whatever. I get low, the enemy ADC dies, and so there's a giant wave here. Again, I understand how important it is to get that crash into base, and so we could easily just look to base here and try to hold this freeze, but then Kaiser would get much less gold to spend, and the wave would eventually crash under our tower, and I would have to come back and fix that wave and not have enough freedom to roam. So I understand this, I recognize this, and I'm going to look to hard shove. I'm going to shove this wave. I'm going to save my relic for the cannon. I'm going to ping my jungler to come and, and shove this as well. And then we're going to crash this whole wave. And now my ADC has much more gold to spend. I have a great roam timer. And we had the freedom to make this decision because their death timers were a little bit longer. If it was earlier on in the game and they were going to come out of the base a lot faster or if we didn't have enough shove, it would take us too long to shove that next wave, this cannon wave under the tower, then maybe we would have to just compromise and base on a freeze or base on a wave under tower. But be on the lookout for this. For this game, this is from the perspective of one of my bronze students, the Jana, and there's going to be a bot fight. Eventually it's going to finish and once the dust settles, let's have a look at what we should do. Okay, fight's over. And so we have a couple of options. We can either try to shove this wave out if we think it's a bad wave, or we can just leave it alone 
since our ADC isn't here, we wouldn't want to necessarily just shove all of these minions and deny them from her, especially if it's pushing into us, right? And we know it's pushing into us because the enemy wave has more minions. And so we can kind of break this scenario down. The absolute best decision is to just leave this wave completely alone, go home. The next best option would be to get our teammates to just shove this wave out and crash the wave. Then they have a little bit more gold and we have some roam timing. But the worst decision would be to try and shove this wave ourselves. And we're not going to be able to do that because we're Janna. We don't have wave clear. We would be actively denying gold from our teammates by taking the minions ourselves. And if we fail to crash the wave, which of course we will by ourselves, then we're just going to set up a freeze on the enemy side of the lane, which is going to make it harder for our ADC to come back to lane and even farm. And so that's unfortunately the decision we make. We're going to try and solo shove. And so on one hand, it's great that they made a decision and they're committing to it and they're thinking about it. It's obvious that they're thinking about the wave and they know how important it is to get a crash into base. And if you make decisions like this and you realize that it doesn't really work out, then you can learn from it and then that's how you improve. So remember that we do want to crash that wave into base, but sometimes we're not going to have that luxury. And sometimes if our ADC isn't even in the lane with us, then we don't necessarily want to deny their minions. For this game, we have the perspective of the Rakan, one of my gold students. And what's going to happen is we are eventually going to get quite chunked out. And so our ADC gets chunked, we get chunked. And so we already need to be thinking about a window for us to base because it's very, very unlikely that we are ever going to be able to get prio now and shove a wave under their tower and base in this condition and in this lane matchup. And so like we have talked about already, we want to base once a wave has crashed under our tower so that our ADC can collect the minions safely and then we can head on home, come back and start pressuring the lane again. Now what we wouldn't want to do is just to hang around in lane on low health indefinitely watching the game just bleed in front of us. And unfortunately that is what is going to happen. We hang around. We're not going to be able to achieve anything in this condition. Still losing. Still getting pushed in. And so be prepared to embrace reality that you just don't really have any more threat in the lane. You're not going to achieve anything. May as well just find a window to base as long as your ADC is not going to lose minions. And so there are going to be some support champs where you want to be prepared to make this decision. Support champs that are very weak in early lane, like Rakan, like Alistair like Janna, like Sona. You want to be prepared for the outcome that you're going to lose early 2v2 and you're not going to get a neat and tidy crash into the enemy wave into base. Sometimes you're just going to catch a wave under your tower and then base and then come back. And that's a lot better than hanging around too long and ending up dying or getting dove. Or slowly bleeding and losing more minions than you otherwise would. In this game, we are the perspective of the Bard, one of my Platinum students. And we're actually going to have a look at what the enemy team ends up doing. And so we're going to die to a gank. And hopefully by now we realize that the enemy team should look to shove in base, right? And if they can't crash this wave, then they should hang around and try to crash the next one. Unfortunately, that's not what they end up doing. So they just shove this wave and then they start to back off. And we're going to see how devastating that can be. This wave doesn't fully crash. And so they are going to miss a lot of minions. We can even count how many minions they miss. Here's a wave. They're going to miss this entire wave. That's one. The wave still hasn't crashed. They're going to miss another entire wave. And so that's just absolutely devastating, right? Two full minion waves early on in the game. Unacceptable, especially once you have gotten the kill and it was within your power to crash that wave and let it push back into you. And we can think about the difference in body language from this game and one of my replays. What I like to think I would do in this situation is I would spam ping to shove this wave. I would be spamming my auto attacks on the minions as much as possible. I would be using my flay, and then if that isn't fast enough to crash a wave, I would be up here, ping, 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 bring my jungler down if I have to, and kill this wave as well. And then that disaster would be avoided. And so not only do they miss those two entire waves, but the wave state is way up on our side of the lane, and they have to come back to the lane. The Thresh doesn't have time to roam. He needs to ensure this wave crashes, and the Kaiser is susceptible to getting ganked, because she has to walk up all the way over here, and then she might just die to our Diana. Now, a little bit later on in this game, and my student does a really good job of something. So the enemy crashes this wave into tower, and they want to look to base. And we're obviously not going to look to hit this wave, because there's no way we want to deny minion from our ADC. But instead of basing ourselves, we are going to interrupt the enemy ADC's base. And the enemy ADC's tempo is much more important than your tempo. So if you think that their ADC is looking to base or needs to base, go be a psycho. Go cancel that base before you look for your own base. 
And so we're going to sprint forwards, cancel Kaisa's base initially, run forwards, cancel her base again. And this is going to have such a big impact, maybe even a third cancel. And now she has all of this gold that she hasn't spent and she's going to be locked in lane and she's kind of missed out on her base window. And you can see the importance that this has. If any of you watch some pro games and you see a support, maybe a psycho support like Hillisang, run under tower and ignite the ADC to cancel bases, this is why. It's going to give you complete control of the lane and probably end up in you going up minions, even waves of minions. For this game, it is my perspective on the rel. And so there's going to be a 2v2 fight. My ADC ends up dying. Enemy ADC ends up dying. And I'm already thinking about wave state. So I don't want this stacked wave to crash into our tower and my ADC to lose all of these minions, right? So if I can hold this freeze, that's what I want to do. And the enemy support, they understand this as well. They're going to try and shove this wave as fast as possible under our tower so that they get the good wave state. And so just pay attention to both of our body languages. He's using all of his spells to shove this as fast as possible. I'm trying to hang around and maybe I can hold this freeze. You can see my body language. I'm posturing. Maybe I can, maybe I can't. And then I realize there's no way. And he's flushing me. He's pushing me away from ever being able to hold this freeze. And so then I just let the wave crash. And then I'm just going to base. Now, if this was the enemy ADC, I would not base here. I would run forwards. I would cancel their base and value their tempo over mine. But since it's just the enemy support, I don't mind. He can base. I can base. And then I can come back to lane and start pressuring. The alternative would be for me to hang around here and try to last hit and maybe get a little bit more experience. That's not my role. I want to be able to pressure the map, create some win cons, not just soak up gold and XP as much as possible. Now, just for another visual of canceling the enemy ADC's tempo, this is from the perspective of one of my gold students on the rail. There's going to be a bot fight. Our Caitlyn ends up dying. And we should have an idea that the enemy ADC wants to look to shove in base. This should come as no surprise. And if we can interrupt their tempo, then that's what we should do. Unfortunately, we decide to just fix our own tempo, value our own tempo over the enemy ADCs. So then what they can do is they can shove that wave under tower and then they can get a nice and efficient base off, spend all of their gold, and then the lane is going to be a little bit tough. Now, sometimes it's going to be tricky to be able to cancel that base, especially if the enemy support is still here, but that's a mini game that you want to play out and explore the limits of. You know, if you're a rel and you're relatively healthy and you have your W, Maybe you can run forwards and then, you know, Alistair combos you, you W away, you survive, you cancel their tempo, you don't die. You're going to have to die sometime to really explore those limits, but as long as you try and you understand how important it is to disrupt the enemy ADC's tempo and not just base for yourself, then that can go a long way. We're going to go over some mid to late game examples of base timers now, and what we will notice is that these timers are going to revolve around teammates' tempo more so than wave states. So let's kick it off with this one, and I am the Rakan. We are setting up a bot dive. This isn't that important. Whatever. We're going to kill them. Get a bunch of kills. Get a bunch of golds. And I want to look to base. And so that's what I'm going to do initially. But then I notice that my Yasuo is going to be staying on the map. And I don't want him to be up here by himself. So I'm going to cancel my base and stay on map. And then my ADC starts basing. So I'm like, oh, okay. So he does want to base. So then I'll just base. And then <laughs> he cancels and then I adapt, right? So you can see how fluid this all can be, constantly embracing the new reality, the new game state. I don't want to base and let him be up here by himself and die uh, trying to get a bot wave or trying to contest with a gromp. There's also no point in me basing and then I'm in base and then I'm coming back out onto the map and my ADC isn't anywhere. And then it's hard to just pressure the map at all. So we'll just play this out a little bit more. I give him the freedom and the space to be able to get this gromp, do whatever he wants on the map, and then we can base if we want. Okay, moving a little bit forwards. And there's going to be a bit of a skirmish around here. Jump in on the Casio. I get super low. And right now, this is when I would see potentially lower elos look to just back off and base. But the fight's not done. You want to hang around. You want to be able to apply as much pressure to the situation, to the skirmish as possible. So I'm going to hang around. I'm going to sweep this out. Maybe I'm going to find a Q to heal up my teammates. Maybe I'm going to find a valuable shield. And again, there's no point in me backing off and being desynced from my team. The fight's still not done. I'm still hanging around. And then I get to clean up on the back end, which obviously wouldn't have happened if I had just backed off. 
And then once the play is done, there's no more fighting. The wave is shoved in. Now it is time to base and we won't be missing out on anything else. Next game, we are the Rakan, and it's going to be a similar point, but this time it's going to be about our jungler's tempo and our jungler pressuring the map. And so we get a couple of kills, bot, and, you know, I have some gold to spend, quite a lot of gold, actually, and I have my wards to be able to fill up, and I don't want to take any gold from my team, so I could very easily just look to base, but I want to be synced up with my teammates. And so if my jungler is actively pressuring the map like he is, then I want to be able to help him out. Maybe the camp is up here and I can help him get this. Maybe we find the enemy jungle. And so once my jungler goes off map, then I will match him. I will go off map as well in our base. So I'm still pressuring. And once I'm comfortable that he is no longer pressuring the map, then I am finally going to look to recall. And it's the concept that's important. Obviously in this one situation, nothing game changing happened here, but in a lot of your other situations, you will notice that when your teammates are pressuring the map actively and you're not around, you're going to miss out on opportunities. Another example, a little bit later in the same game, there's going to be quite an extended fight around this area. We're just going to speed through this. Do a bit of a fight here. Still fighting. Getting heavily chunked out by the Mordekaiser we are. And again, I could easily just look to base now and say I have no cooldowns, I'm very low. Let's just hope that my teammates get out alive. But you can see my body language. I really want to stay around and help as much as possible. I'm going to hit the plant so I have a little bit more resources to potentially help out on a fight. Unfortunately, the ADC dies. It's a concept that's important. And then I realized that my Garen still uh, is active on the map and might need a little bit of my help to get out. And then what's going to happen is I would be okay finding a window to base here, but my Garen is looking to pressure the map. So I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to end up basing. I'm going to look to link up with him and maybe we can achieve something. And that's exactly what we do. I know that Mordekaiser just altered me. He has no ult. The dust has kind of settled. And so this is an opportunity for a pick. We find a pick. Obviously, this would never have happened if I just immediately based after I got chunked initially. Now, once my Garen has gotten the kill and Garen has gotten his minions, now I am more than happy to just look to back off. This is the last example, and there are going to be quite a few layers to this one, so make sure you're paying attention. There is going to be a fight here. Obviously, we're not going to look at the execution of the fight. We're going to wait until the dust settles. We are the Rakan here, obviously. Okay, we get a bunch of kills, and so obviously we could just look to base now right like we have a bunch of gold we can fill up our wards heal up whatever but the whole enemy team just died right and so that would be a little bit silly for us to use this window of opportunity that we can pressure and take over the map to just base and so we're going to hang around we're going to look to take herald and that's what we uh, start to do and then the enemy pantheon ults in and so now we're going to jump onto the pantheon we're going to get that kill and so now the enemy team is starting to respawn. They're going to be full health, full mana, gold spent, were chunked, haven't spent our gold. And so we would be overstaying our turn if we were to hang around and still try to get the Herald. We have used our turn by not finishing the Herald and by killing the Pantheon instead. And we recognize that. And so instead, we're just going to peel off, you know, shove the mid wave, get a mid ward, and then look to efficiently base. Just notice how clean it all looks. Now, our whole team is coming back out onto the map at the same time. Our tempo is synced up and now we're ready to do something. And if we didn't have this nice, neat and tidy synced up tempo, it'd be really hard to just freely control Top River and to freely hit the Herald. But because we're placing an emphasis on being on map and off map at the same time as our team, then everything can just line up neatly and tidily and make the game a lot smoother. Thanks for watching. Please consider liking and subscribing if you enjoyed. Big thank you to all of my Patreons over here. I really couldn't do this without you. Um, the links for coaching, for Patreon, for my School of Support Discord server, for socials, they're all going to be linked in the description below. Any and all support is greatly appreciated.